Stand by to roll. Camera one. Rolling. Scene three, take one. Action! In the distant past of the year 2000, the LEGO group was teetering on the edge of disaster. Pokemon was dominating the children's toy market, and LEGO was struggling to keep up. Their savior, the soon-to-be massively popular Bionicle, was still in development, and wouldn't hit store shelves until 2001. And LEGO Star Wars, the first of LEGO's now myriad efforts in licensing other intellectual properties for their products, was doing the bulk of the heavy lifting in keeping the LEGO group's head above water. But then, in 2000, the LEGO Group announced a new licensing partnership, one of a slightly broader cinematic influence than just one film series. The new line was LEGO Studios, and was launched in partnership with famed film director Steven Spielberg. The flagship set launched with not only a densely detailed film soundstage LEGO set, but also a digital camera and editing software, with which kids could make their own LEGO movies, a whole five years before YouTube hit the web. But what we're interested in here are the two video games that launched in association with these physical sets, one directly inspired by the new line and one tangentially related to it, but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. In an April 2011 interview with Brick Journal magazine, LEGO designer Hans Henrik Sidanius revealed that the thread of LEGO Studios development ran all the way back to 1997, when LEGO designer Rick Segrist visited Walt Disney Studios in the United States. Inspired by what he saw there, Segrist began developing what would eventually become the Studios line. In developing this product line, LEGO realized that to truly fulfill their vision, they'd need dedicated partners. Pinnacle Systems would develop the editing software that would eventually ship with the flagship set, but there was still a partner missing, someone who might bring legitimacy and gravitas to the project. A list of possible names was drawn up, and according to LEGO marketing director Lars Nyengard, Steven Spielberg was at the top. Several phone calls and in-person meetings later, and LEGO had Spielberg on board. Serendipitously, Spielberg had previously himself had an idea for a children's filmmaking product, but hadn't been able to bring such ideas to fruition until LEGO approached him with their idea for the studio's line. Steven would help craft some of the more production-specific elements of the line, suggesting ideas for the functionality of the film set set and what props could be included with it, and soon LEGO had a product ready for store shelves. And as a young boy growing up in the shadow of the Hollywood sign, these sets were of immediate interest to me. I didn't ever have the really big one, though I don't know if that was because of its price tag or because my family already had more than one video camera, and our home computer already had editing software on it. But I did have a few of the smaller sets, and that's why I have my own tiny LEGO movie slate. And so the first of these two games I'd like to talk about involves the production of a sizzling hot new action movie set on one of the most famous locations in the LEGO universe, LEGO Island. <laughs> The game is 2002's Island Extreme Stunts, the third entry in the LEGO Island franchise. Extreme Stunts takes its name from the in-universe blockbuster action film being set on the island, which sees our very own tiny LEGOized Steven Spielberg at the helm, though he is never named as such. We've covered a bit of the history of Island Extreme Stunts elsewhere on this channel, so by way of a quick recap, after the release of LEGO Island in 1997 and LEGO Island 2 Brickster's Revenge in 2001, the LEGO group was interested in continuing to capitalize on LEGO Island's successes. This interest even preceded the release of LEGO Island 2, as design documents cataloged by Bricks to Bytes show that pre-production on LEGO Island 3 had begun as early as October of 2000. This version of the game would have seen Pepperoni leave the sandy comfort of LEGO Island to instead follow the path of Marco Polo to find Pepper's missing father. But the physical theme LEGO was hoping would tie into LEGO Island 3 supposedly didn't test very well, and the story was quickly changed to one with an extreme sports focus, more in line with the previous LEGO Island games, and whose new story is reflected in design documents from less than a year after the original. It's not 
phenomenally clear when exactly development began to include characters from the studio's line, or if such inclusion was at the behest of the LEGO group or just an interesting element Silicon Dreams sought to include on their own. But we know that the change must have occurred between the end of 2000 and the fall of 2001, when, according to documents previously listed on archive.org but since delisted, I assume, at the request of the LEGO group, Silicon Dreams began using the Extreme Stunts title on their docks, rather than the simpler and more obvious LEGO Island 3. And while the key art and general vibe of the game would lead one to believe it was truly just an open-world Tony Hawk-ish LEGO Island spin-off, it is really, first and foremost, a LEGO Studios game. The lens through which we view the whole narrative of Island Extreme Stunts is that of the film production taking place on LEGO Island. The opening moments of the game are Pepper doing a massive bike stunt into the studio lot. The conceit of every story-progressing minigame is that you're shooting one of the movie's key action set pieces, even to the point of introducing and tutorializing each minigame in a virtual production blue room. Level and stage transitions are either star wipes or motivated by the sharp clap of a camera slate, and your mastery of LEGO Island is measured in gold, silver, and bronze LEGO Academy of Film and Television awards. The whole game is wrapped up in Hollywood magic and gives the final installment of the LEGO Island series a wonderfully unique flavor. But minifigure movie making wasn't just confined to Lego Island. In fact, Elsewhere in the LEGO universe, production was falling apart on the set of Johnny Thunder vs. the World Crime League, production that you, the newest production assistant at LEGO Studios, need to get back on track. Regular Subpixel viewers will recognize friends of the channel Templar Studios, the team behind the Matanui online game, as the developers of LEGO Studios Backlot. Backlot was a fascinating game to me for a multitude of reasons. Firstly, it was a game exclusively about the ins and outs of filmmaking. Even by age 9, when I first played Backlot on a chunky desktop computer in my father's office on the Warner Brothers lot, I had osmosed enough of the facts of filmmaking from my father, then at Warner Brothers and previously a freelancer around Myriad Studios and film sets, that I could feel an aura of legitimacy radiating off of Backlot, even if it played a bit fast and loose with how major movie studios were actually run, with your player character getting promoted to director after accomplishing a few relatively simple tasks as a production assistant. But beyond that, it was a 3D game running in a browser, which was not something I'd ever experienced before. I'd played 3D games on the computer, but they were always running off of a disc. I'd played them on consoles too, but we were now several years on from Mario 64, so in my mind 3D was the rule rather than the exception. But I'd never played a 3D game on a browser. And it took a thousand years to load, but once it did, it was extraordinary. Here was this weird little game about making it big on your way to the silver screen, and I loved every wonky minute of it. LEGO Backlot was launched in 2002, two years after the formal launch of the line it was promoting, and Templar Studios president Peter Mack speculated that it was because of the success of their episodic 2001 adventure, the Matanui online game, that LEGO decided to give them the reins to Backlot. I think we were just creating the look and feel and romance and excitement of a Hollywood studio environment for players to explore. And that, that was the idea. And that's the voice of Peter Mack himself, recorded for an episode of the delightful Bits and Bricks podcast, which I'd highly recommend checking out in its entirety. According to Mack, Templar Games was an interesting oddity in the game's development sphere, in that nobody working at the studio had any real background in video game development when the studio was founded. Though ironically, or providentially perhaps, they all had the perfect background with which to make Backlot. And myself and most of the people I was working with were all graduates of film school. So this was weirdly in our wheelhouse. It sort of connected with us in a lot of ways, and we were super comfortable imagining what the possible gameplay could be for this because many of us had not too many years previously been spending our time on movie sets in school. 
Mac recalled the team being given a lot of freedom to craft the game as they saw fit, as had been the case with their development of the Matanui online game, since web gaming was still a bit of a wild west in the halcyon days of the early 2000s. It was the early days of online video games, so a lot of stuff was pretty fast and loose, and everyone was learning as they go, and everyone knew that they were doing something that hadn't been done before, so it was really developed and produced with the care and attention and organization that we could best bring to it. But given that it was a game and non-linear and it was an open world, these were all things that were new then and needed to be explored. So there was a lot of license given. But even if the final product wasn't a perfect one, a stance Peter and the rest of the folks at Templar have been quick to take, Backlot still made an enormous impression upon players, one that has lasted to this day. Though this revelation in the Bits and Bricks podcast did seem to surprise Peter. I think we very much had a right place at the right time and right people in the right place at the right time. Equation going on where this new technology had arrived and we had very creative artistic people who were uh, in love with it and technical people as well. I would love to point at the game being a, a great uh, landmark or a, a milestone in uh, video game history. I, I'm not sure I'd go that far. I think that it, it, it did hit a generation of kids uh, just before phones and just before Xboxes and stuff that had access to it, that had we not been there uh, then at that time, maybe we wouldn't have had the opportunity to make something like this. Backlot is a wonderful little movie-centric relic of early web game development, and the perfect blend of video game and marketing tool. Within LEGO Studios, two sound stages are digital simulacrums of their real-life sets, the Explosion Studio and Steven Spielberg Movie Maker set, an effect replicated by the team at Silicon Dreams with their own work on eyelid extreme stunts. We've seen more and more of that from LEGO games in recent years, most recently with much of the world of LEGO 2K Drive, but it's never quite been so symbiotic as it was in the early 2000s. LEGO Studios' backlot and Island Extreme stunts were made in part as a means of selling the physical sets featured in those games. Nowadays, the designers of LEGO games with the powerful tools of modern game engines can essentially take any LEGO set they want and put it in their game as a neat bit of set dressing. But if I had one wish for the next generation of LEGO games, it would be for them to adapt more of their first-party properties into video games like they did with LEGO Studios. And which of the LEGO Group's properties would you like to see be made into video game form? Let us know down in the comments. I think I know they're never going to do this, but I would love to have an Exoforce game in the style of Armored Core. I think that would just be, like, the hypest thing ever. And on that note, as always, I am Jake Terrio, and this has been another episode of Subpixel Spotlight.